Um, <laughs> the viewer asks, and Bruno, this is for you. The viewer says, my wife and I assisted my son in buying a, a home. My son would not have qualified for the bond on his own. My son has, however, been paying the monthly installments on this and has never skipped or missed a payment. Unfortunately, <clears throat> my wife has passed on recently. What are the implications, if any, in this regard? And there's a second part to this question, which says, um, my wife and I were married in community of property, and now with my wife having passed on, um, what is the process? Do I have to take the property off of her name and transfer it into my own? Um, are there going to be costs involved in this? And, and, and lastly, who pays for this? Bruno? Sure. Um, yeah, that's actually a really good question because it's, it's quite complicated and has quite a lot of facets to it. So I think um, the most important part of this is actually to try to uh, start in the right place. And I suppose that that would maybe be to try set out the context um, and, uh, uh, you know, in terms of which the question is being asked. So what I'm understanding here, and I'm making certain assumptions based on the information I've been given, but since he mentions in community of property and the transfer from her name to his name, uh, obviously it's, it means that they are owners of the property. Uh, but at the beginning, they say that they assisted the son in buying the property. So just, just to clarify that we're going to, sorry, I think it's two separate properties. So he's asking one on the property ah. that was, that they assisted the son in obtaining and ah. two on the property that he, that he owned with his wife. Uh, yeah. Ah, okay. So they're not as complicated. This is a lot easier. Thank you for that. <laughs> because this is like a puzzle. I was breaking it up and trying to piece it together. No, this is fine. Okay. So uh, question number one regarding the son, um, if he's, if, if himself and his wife stood in, uh, this could be one of two things. It could be joint ownership. It doesn't change the possibility that it's joint ownership, but very often the banks won't actually require that. Um, they're, they're looking for surety ships to be signed. So again, now I'm making an assumption, you know, in, in, in the interest of time, but uh, the banks sometimes allow for someone to sign as a surety on behalf of somebody else if they feel that person doesn't have the necessary affordability. Uh, so based on that, uh, the wife is surety and himself is surety over the, over the son's debt to the bank, uh, as, simply because obviously, uh, simply because the wife passed away doesn't necessarily mean anything to this deal. Uh, yes, I have seen complicated finance transactions where if one surety passes away, they insist on finding another surety uh, to sign on on behalf of, of the debtor. But that's not necessarily the case. And what I noticed with the retail banks is more often than not, if one of the sureties does pass away, that's simply uh, just what happens. Uh, if no one's in arrears and no one's in default, it just continues with the sureties that do remain. If it is co-ownership, it obviously gets a lot more complicated because it means that now a portion, an undivided share of that property now falls within a deceased estate. And the bank, obviously, having a claim against all three owners, potentially, may very well start calling up the amount that's due to it. And in that, in those circumstances, we need to start talking about how estates get administered and how that undivided half share weight would be transferred. And that's why I was saying it's a complicated question, because then I need to jump into estate administration and have a discussion on what happens first, that undivided half share, uh, which kind of touches on the second question. So the second question is him and the wife are married in community of property. Uh, so sorry, so to, uh, the first question, if it's a surety ship, I wouldn't worry about it. Everything does go on as per normal. The son remains owner of the property. He stays as a surety and the other surety just falls away. This does get reported to the bank. So if there are any requirements we don't know of, like the signing of a further surety by somebody else, the bank would ask for it. Although I doubt that's the case. So the second question potentially deals with another property, but it can, you know, even if it's the same property, the same uh, context would apply. Um, now, in community of property basically means that all the assets fall into one joint estate. 
One joint estate just means basically one pool and everything's mixed inside. There's no distinction between what's mine, and what's yours. You, you are, for all intents and purposes, one person, right? So when, when you own a property, an immovable property under these circumstances, that immovable property belongs to both of you, this one person that you've created now. So theoretically, there's an undivided half share that it's undivided and it's, it's not specified, but it does technically belong to your spouse and half share belongs to you. So now that's one thing that we need to remember. Theoretically speaking, at that moment in time in community of property, when the person passes away, the surviving spouse has a claim against this joint estate for half of everything in that joint estate because that's what belongs to them. So even half the property would have to be um, would have to be endorsed at the deeds office as belonging to them because it's their half. And now with the passing away, it will be endorsed as belonging to them. Uh, there's something you also do at the bank to endorse this, and, uh, but it is relatively easy. It's just a process the conveyance is followed, it's captured on the title deed, not that difficult. A difficulty sometimes comes in on the second leg of this, which is your the deceased spouse what did they do with their undivided share of the property? Because it now depends on how they dealt with it. If there's a will and they left it to somebody else, uh, you know, aside from being unfortunately very poor estate planning, because now there's implications behind that, but if they did leave it to somebody else, it means that now you're going to be co-owner with another person. And the difficulty sometimes also starts um, arising when there's money that's actually due to the bank. Because now the bank says, well, the bottom line is you guys owe me the money. So I, I need the money to be, to be paid. I don't just swap debtors. I'm not just going to take this new person and just take them on board and say, great, you know what? You're now the new debtor. It doesn't work like that. So if this has to be moved to somebody else, uh, the, the deceased portion of the estate needs to be moved to somebody else, that debt needs to be settled. And this is where estate planning comes in. Because if you haven't done liquidity planning, it means that at the end of the day, if there's not enough money in the estate to pay off the debt, you may have to sell the property. Or the person taking over the property would have to apply for their own finance to be able to afford the cancellation of the bond. Um, so it's in a simple answer, it's not difficult. If, if your wife did leave it to you, uh, then it shouldn't be difficult at all because you would just step into the shoes. Uh, you'd apply to, uh, apply to the bank and if the bank's happy, you become the sole debtor, you become sole owner and it's done. If, uh, if it's more complicated with the property going off to somebody else or the debt being very high, that might be a different story uh, that, that does need a bit of specialized attention.